Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Aura Bora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Dan from Orange County Soccer Club. Thanks for coming. People who don't know, what does your company do? What is the thing you're you're, you're doing? What's well, your pursuit? First of all, thank you very much for, for having me. Well, hopefully the name's sort of in the title. So Orange County Soccer Club, we are a professional soccer team in Orange County. I'm obviously English and I would love to call it football, but in this country, I have to keep calling it soccer. We're a professional team. So everyone I think has heard of, of the MLS, which is obviously the top league here in America. And yeah. we play in the USL, which is the level below. So it's the second tier, yeah. but it's still fully professional. We play in front of... 5,000 sometimes drunken fans every other Saturday from March to October in Irvine in Orange County and it's a really good standard of of soccer in a really fun family friendly environment so if you're a a sports fan it's a great place to go if you're a soccer fan it's a really interesting concept because it is different from what you might see on television, but it's a great place to go. I wanted to have you on for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, the MLS is exploding at the moment. We could we could actually say it's been exploding for some time. Yeah. There's always been these moments where someone like Messi comes on, whether it's Beckham or some of these other players that have come on prior. But here we are in sort of what seems to be a real soccer explosion in America where even Apple TV is getting involved, and so there just seems to be a lot more eyeballs in this. Uh, even the female side of it, with Angel City, there's a lot more content being created and so it seems like there's a bigger buzz. Ryan Reynolds goes ahead and, and he's buying a team, not at the quite the Premier League, but nonetheless, he's in the mix yeah. and, and he's bringing buzz to that. And so what made you want to do this? What, what, what did you see opportunity-wise, business-wise that you said, you know, this is, besides of being a fan, what opportunity did you see? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting moment in, in soccer here because obviously soccer has been around for a long time yeah. uh, and Theoretically, some of the best players in the world have played in America, albeit in what felt more like an exhibition format when Pelé used to play at the New York Cosmos. And obviously the World Cup was here back in uh, 84. And so that should have been the moment that sort of sparked the growth of the game. And it certainly made a difference, but it never really caught on quite the same way. So the major four American sports stayed on top. I would say in the last probably two or three years, it's really started to really catch fire and then probably the last 18 months and it's a weird combination I think of four factors that feel like they shouldn't be related but somehow are so Mm -hmm. Ted Lasso which you know it's the most optimistic man in the world yeah I mean it's just a tv show but it's also a tv show that somehow you know I think people were looking for good news and a a fun positive story and it just happened to be set around soccer and the number of people in America who might not know anything about soccer but watch that show, I think that starts bringing the sport into the orbit of some people who didn't know. So you've got that. Then you've got the whole Ryan Reynolds, We Are Wrexham thing. So everyone knows that you know the power of Hollywood. But what, where it's worked actually really well for our team is, you know, he buys a team that's lovely, but he hasn't bought a Premier League team, as you say. He's bought a team who were in the fifth division when he bought them. They're now in the fourth division. So Americans who never really understood the concept of promotion relegation but also the concept of there being anything other than the top league there's plenty of people in america who don't know there's a g league and an xfl they just know you know the big sports so why would there be in soccer a second tier i think we are excellent has helped people understand that in advanced soccer countries there's multiple levels and in terms of level the league two which is where wrexham now sit is probably the equivalent Mm -hmm. of the usl so I think our teams would, if, if Wrexham played against Orange County... What a dream that would be. It would be a dream. I mean, they were they were in San Diego recently, and we did try and see if we could do something with them. But level-wise, I think they would beat us in, in Wales because our players wouldn't be used to the, the wind and the rain and the snow. <laughs> but I think we sure. could beat them out here. So I think that's made a, that's brought, you know, football, sorry, soccer into people's consciousness. Then you've got the fact that the World Cup's here in three years' time. And the way America does sporting events... You, you, however much you hate soccer, when it comes, you'll know it's here. There'll be so much media, there'll be so much coverage. It will be everywhere. And it's it in the Americas, so it'll be Canada, I think, yeah, all of North America. Yeah, so it'll be yeah, all of Mexico. North America, but the, the way the Americans will do it, it'll be like you know, sure. well, 50 Super Bowls in a month. So it'll be it'll be huge. So the soccer fans will lose their minds. There's not a single game in LA, by the way. Well, they're still working that the, through. Uh, I yeah, think, I'm really hoping that at least... Yeah, there's some weird it's pitch, strange. pitch width issues that they're trying to work through for SoFi. But I think it'll be amazing for the sport to have it here because you just won't be able to avoid it. And then I think the fourth piece is, is Lionel Messi 
coming here. And again, he's one of those sports stars who transcends the game. So if somebody in the world knows one player's name, it will be his. They won't know the offside law. They won't really understand the game, but they'll know who he is. And I think, again, that, that superstardom in America particularly plays so well. So you add those four factors together and sort of everyone now is becoming a fan. Mm -hmm. So you've had your diehards for years who get up at five o'clock on a Saturday morning to watch yeah. their EPL team. But now you've got people just taking a, this broader interest in the game because of these different factors. And I think it, it makes a massive difference. And you're starting to see it now with things like... So Tom Brady, who obviously everyone's heard of from his sport, has now, yeah. now owns part of a soccer team in England. JJ Watt now owns part of a soccer team in England. Obviously, you've got Ryan Reynolds sure. and what he's doing. And I think soccer's become sexy now. It's not this sort of nerdy sport with slightly complicated rules. Yeah. Everyone wants to play it. And the American women are the best in the world and have been for a very long time. For a long so that time. definitely They've... helps as well. And so what opportunity did you see in there other than, like, I'm, like more specifically as it relates to what does the upside look like? And so what, well, I don't know anything about this, which is why yeah. I find this fascinating. And so when I think about Magic Johnson has a cool story where when he first got into like the professional business arena, so outside of basketball, he learned that he could take an AM radio station and flip it to FM. And that's how he made his first amount of money. And so the idea is you buy a station, no one listens to it, you get it popular enough to where there's a bunch of listeners, then you acquire or you, know, you, you have now the audience that garners specific attention to the heights of an FM radio station, which sounds so antiquated today. Yeah. But once you once you flip it, then you've basically bought an AM asset, right? So in the real estate game, an underutilized asset, and then you've built something really interesting, and now it's worth a lot more. Same asset, you just did something. And so you can do that in, in digital space, AM, FM. Is soccer the same way? I think it is now. So, so that's what you see in there. That's the... Yeah, 100%. I think sports teams... Are not always, you know, there's a certainly in England, there used to be this joke around, you know, how do you become a millionaire? You start as a billionaire and you buy a soccer team. And, you know, there, there's something in that. Sports is not known. It's, it's known as a place where rich people can write off some of their tax losses and have some fun along like a the yacht. way. And that was, you know, that was definitely the case. And in, in the USL, the league we play in, it would be fair to say teams are not turning a profit at the moment. But there's a real opportunity because of the growth of the game and because... Beyond the MLS, there's so much upside opportunity. The, the franchise value is where the real opportunity is. So, you know, as a team, I think that's super. We can definitely, there's a, there's a real sort of revenue opportunity in the traditional sense. So we sell all the things you'd expect us to sell. Yeah. We sell merchandise, like that wonderful scarf that Great you're wearing. Scarf. Thank the, you. The, the gnome, the, the mascot. We obviously sell tickets. We have sponsorship revenue. Okay. We have a unique opportunity in our league. So... In America, in, if somebody's moving from an NBA team to another NBA team, you'll be trading them for a player or maybe for, for draft picks or some future value. In soccer, everywhere else in the world, people are paying money for players. And we've seen an opportunity. Oh, interesting. Okay. And we've been the first team to do this really significantly here in America. So we've sold six players to European teams. Oh, wow. So those transfer values are not huge at the outset so it's a, it can be a few hundred thousand dollars yeah. but the way these things work is so we sold a player the other day to Feyenoord who are the Dutch champions and we sold him for it was a few hundred thousand dollars he's now playing over there they are the sort of team who will develop a player and then sell them to a, a Man United or a Newcastle or a PSG for wow. 10, 20, 30 million dollars wow. and we get some of that okay. so you get so a you percentage get some future value some kind of sort of it depends on the player and on the deal, but these things That's can be somewhere between 10 and 20%. So wow. you start getting checks for... That's, yeah. a, that's a lot of hot dogs you have to sell to match what you can get from selling a player. Just so I understand it. And so when you think about the business, you think, okay, my revenue models, right? And so if there's a list of three of them, the number one revenue source is, is sourcing these players, identifying talent, I guess, and then selling them. Is that number one? So not yet. Okay. So the traditional model has been like every sports team. It's say it's sponsorship, it's merchandise, it's ticket sales and yeah. you know concessions in the stadium, all that sort of usual. And we have that and it's growing because the sport's growing and we're selling out the stadium but we have uh, I suppose you would call the fifth quarter as it were so we've got this extra opportunity which teams haven't really been doing in the American soccer market which is about player value so in America if there's a if there's a good player who's 15 or 16 the, the dream for his 
his or her parents is go to college and the scholarship is is covering the tuition. That's that's what you want. That doesn't really work for high level soccer. If you are Barcelona or Real Madrid, you don't want a kid who's now 21 who spent three years playing against other kids. Like that's not how you develop a player. You want a player in who's 16 who you can teach the way you want to play, you know, the methodology of your club, you manage all their nutrition. They're not having to worry about studying for some I'll, I'll speak to this a little science bit. degree. When I was 13 or so, I was in Massachusetts playing soccer, and so we, we ended up getting plucked to go play in Belgium, a small group of us. And for people listening, that's when, that's when it all happens. 12 yeah. to probably, even at 14, you're probably a little bit, you're on your way out if you're not really that yeah. talented. So 12 to 14 is when you start to get plucked into these uh, farm teams into this like grooming and it's always overseas it can be in south america it can be in mexico it can be but mostly for the most part if you want to make it it's in europe yeah and at that time for me personally that's when i knew my career was over because i was now on on the pitch on the field with some crazy talented people you yeah, know yeah. it would be like here's federer like you're seeing federer you're yeah. playing on the field with him you might be a year two years older younger doesn't matter but the talent level is so insane. Yeah, so That's when I knew for me it was over. I tried to make it work, but it didn't. And then to your point before, then you're playing in high school and college is effectively a complete waste of time. Yeah. Unless you, you, some people do, they have later, you know, later on things click. But for the most part, it doesn't work that way. It's no, and, and, you know, obviously American colleges, you know, playing Division One soccer is a real thing. You know, there's very talented player. But as you say, there's a fact, you know, sometimes Americans struggle with this as a concept, but there are people in the world who are better at things. In, in the major American sports, you know, the world championship is the domestic league. But obviously in soccer, everyone knows that the, the best soccer is played in Europe yeah. at club level. Yeah. So even though, you know, maybe the best nation might be Brazil, but all of their best players go and play in Europe because that's just where it is. Yeah. And part of the reason the American soccer team are doing so well at the moment is because... Their players, and this is no disrespect to the MLS, but their players are not playing here. They are playing at Chelsea and AC Milan and Juventus and Barcelona. They're testing themselves against the very best in the world. Yeah, the top strikers at Chelsea, yeah. right? And then they're bringing it back right. and playing for the national team at this new higher level because they've, they've seen a different Which way. is what every other country does. So Which is what every other country does. <laughs> so that's pretty standard. And yet it hasn't been a thing in American soccer. So we've mm -hmm. started making it a thing. So we've sold more players to European teams than any other team in North America. So more than MLS teams. Wow. And, and how do you do that? What are you, how are you sourcing them? So I think it's a couple of things. So we would never talk about players as commodities as it were but this this is a business facing podcast so you know it's like a, horse betting there's a bit of supply and demand here. Sure. so you need to find the players you need a system to develop the players and then you need a place to send them and there are some teams here who are amazing at one or two of those things but you have to do all three because you can't sell players if they're not good enough if you get brilliant players and can't do anything with them there's nothing really to sell there so you need that ability to recruit you need to really work at how to develop them and then you need somewhere them to go. And I think for us, it almost started at the, at the far end of this. So we had an incredibly well set up network because our sporting director was Swiss, had played at a good level, had worked as an agent, had worked as a coach. He, he had amazing relationships with European teams. Okay. His deputy was formerly the chief scout at a Premier League team. So he was very good at sort of understanding player skills. And we had a good young player. So he was a, a player who was US under 18 goalkeeper. And we used our network and we sold him to Rangers, who are the best team in Scotland, or second best team, depending on if you ask the other team in Scotland. And, uh, you know, we sold him there. And I think when we sold one, people started thinking, you know, what is, what is this that they're doing? Because it's so different to any other model. And we used that first one to show it can be done. And then we started recruiting on the basis that come to us, you get to play in a real level of football in front of real fans. So against men and with men, not just people your own age. And you will learn the game in a different way. Um, and then we'll sell you. And that's our, our deal. You come to us, play for a while, and then you'll go. And is part of your pitch, come to Southern California? Yeah. So I mean, to, it has to be, right? There's certainly something in that because there's worse places to, <laughs> to, to live and to yeah. work and to play. Of course. But, you know, we hired a guy out of Inter Miami's academy, a young guy called Kobe Henry. 
He came to play for us. He played central defence alongside a chap called Michael Orozco, who'd played 28 times for the US national team. So you've got a very experienced older player with this young guy. We win the national championship, so we get a, we get a star on our, on our logo. In the, I like that part of America. You don't get that in England. It's on the scarf. <laughs> it's everywhere. The, scar, the star is it's everywhere because we've got it. And then we sold him to a team in France for what was then a record transfer fee for our league. And then, and he was the US under-19 captain. We've also had the US under-18 captain who we just sold to Feyenoord. So the other day, we ended up wow. recruiting probably the, probably the best 16-year-old in the country. He was at Atlanta United, and he came to us. Maybe some of it was the weather, but also because he, he, he can see the future, right. and the future is play for us for a year or two. Learn we from will, some of the best. Yeah, we will integrate you into the first team because you can't start these kids too young because then they get brutalised in, in quite a physical league. So you've got to, yeah. to time it. And then, and then you go and you see these players earning real money and having real opportunity over in Europe. And it's a sort of, it's becoming a conveyor belt That's now. pretty cool, yeah. So taking it back to the business, this year we will have done maybe 10 to 20% of our revenue will be from the transfer model. If one of these players gets that second transfer, yeah. then somebody's writing you a check for one to five million. And that starts being really significant. And so what do you do with that as a businessman? Do you start thinking to yourself, how do I reinvest it in the business? And then what do you reinvest it in? Is media an opportunity? Is streaming? I don't know. TV yeah, right? that's I, big I, enough I for mean, that. Some of the TV stuff is you know, through the league. We've just actually okay. announced a deal with CBS. So games are going to be on CBS and, and Paramount, which is huge. Which is which wow. is great for us. Yeah, I think for us, it's about then developing the next players. Okay. So it's it's finding them. To so go back to what you're good at. Yeah. Building the better now, system. W- w- there's a sort of twin track to this. So there's one part of it, which is just building the club in all the normal ways. How do we get more people in? How do we increase average ticket revenue? How do we sell more? You know, how many more gnomes can we sell this year? You know, normal growth of any business. We've got three revenue streams. How do we grow each of those ones? But this player development one, it's a different type of skill set required. Uh, And some of it, I think, is about first mover advantage. And then it gives us this chance to build this up. But then also what you start having is really exciting young players. You know, some of the best young players in the country are playing for our our club. People want to come and see those. Hopefully, when the World Cup's here in three years' time, we're hoping a couple of the players in that national team will be our former players, which is incredible for branding both for recruiting more players but then also back to selling tickets merchandise sponsorship and so on so if you get it right it's a really interesting model i think about it like okay so you, so you understand the concept of sort of getting the asset in term, in this case it's the players and then i think the hardest part would seem like you want to get the right coaching or the right scouts the right people yeah that the players can also trust saying this guy has found and has identified yeah it is and there's a whole methodology and i don't i want to give away any trade secrets but yeah actually much as i'd like to say this whole thing is me the the guys <laughs> on the technical side of the business are the ones who perfected this model sure sure but there's a whole thing we've got the first team we've got the reserves and they're in different locker rooms and they train on sort of adjacent fields and there's a way of just helping the younger players, someone has a good session or is showing the right sort of characteristics, you let them train with the first team for a while, but then you you know send them back appropriately as well, just to get that balance right, give them opportunities. We've, you know, there've been games where we've had a couple of injuries, so we've put a young player on the bench with no intention of playing him, but just so he goes on the flight with the grown-ups, he sits on the bench with the grown-ups, he sees where the TV cameras are, he hears the thousands of fans in the stadium. That whole thing, it just it's like everything, it's 10,000 hours. So it's just getting them used to some of this. So when they have their moment, yeah. you know, they're not scared. They've been, they've been blooded, as it were. Yeah. And there's a whole thing, you know, you can't go too soon, you can't go too slowly. Wow. I think a big thing, and it's, it's the sort of thing that you wouldn't think about as a sports fan. You know, you go along and you watch whatever it is, the home runs, the dunks, whatever it is in your sport. But yeah. dressing room etiquette and knowing how to conduct yourself as a professional is incredibly important and really highly valued yeah. by European teams. And I think in the past, maybe, I think I'm allowed to say this, living in America as a guest of your country, but you know, I think there's a, there has been a brashness to Americans that hasn't always gone well in Europe. And if, if you turn up in a European football dressing room 
and you think you're amazing because you were the best kid at 12 years old in your high school in Ohio. As you say, you know, the experience you had, you go and see these players, they're like, you know, who is this guy? And you can get, you can get eaten up really quickly. So there needs to be, you've got to have the self-confidence, but there needs to be the ability to be, to be coachable, to be teachable, to be part of a team. Yeah. And for us, that's a really big part as well. It's the sort of, how do you behave on, on road trips? How do you conduct yourself? Because if you go into Europe and you're not ready for that, there's a load of kids who are about the same standard who do know how to do that, and then you just get thrown on the pile. That's so incredibly true. I think the way I would phrase it is, I, I definitely didn't have it. I think I was the brash American you're referring to, um, unfortunately. But I think, I think what I learned was the quiet confidence matters a lot. Yeah. So just once you get your moment, be willing to step up to the plate and, and know you have it. Yeah. But don't ever say anything you don't have to say. Tell me about your trip. Yeah. So obviously, I know you went as a group, not as like an individual trial. But sure. I know you said you realized quickly that you weren't at the level. But yeah. how did the group take it? Did everyone come away thinking, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was? Or how did that play it's out? A, it's a good Yeah. And so a bunch of us went. I remember the first time we practiced, the coach, we all end up going to this field and the, the coach just throws the ball up and goes all right you guys make your own teams eight on eight go and nobody knew each other yeah. none of us had known each other some of us had knew each other because we've seen each other play or you know happen to play against each other once or twice at like regionals but no one knew each other and so we were like okay and so you immediately the coach is really just vetting out who's the leader here yeah. right and so you're on the spot immediately and so it went from all of us getting our Adidas bags, which had home and away jerseys and us being like, wow, you know, to balls up fields. And, and I'm just walking. Like I'm like lost. I was also really young. I was the yeah. youngest kid on the team. Okay. And so I really had no idea. And the coach is yelling at me the whole time. He's like, you're never going to play. This is not going to work for you. Wow. Like assert yourself. What are you doing? You know? And I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing I could have ever <laughs> signed up for. <laughs> so that was fun. And then we get, you know, to Belgium. And we end up playing a lot, I think, teams from all around Europe, but most of the players were, were Dutch. Yeah. And we're playing these guys, and all the games were at the stadiums. Oh, wow. And so we're playing in the stadiums. Obviously, they're empty, but you're in it. You know, I think as a soccer player, as a young player, you remember the grass. The grass yeah. is something you could use to smell, the feel, the quality. And so for the first time, a lot of us were playing on like the best grass we had ever seen. The lines were painted the best. Everything was just next level. And we, and we were able to hang out in the locker rooms, which was also just so next level. And so we'd take like buses there and we'd go and I'll never forget. So the one thing that I'll never forget forever is basically this really good player on our team kicks a ball that I would say in any world is a, is a goal upper 90 you know, and the goalie on the other side's like 13, 14. So he's not six foot four. He's small still. Mm. We're all small, right? Some of us are like bigger than others, but for the most part, no one's fully developed. And this kid somehow, like an acrobat, like a spider, <laughs> just saves the ball, upper 90, on like a regulation goal at a stadium. Yeah. And it, I stopped moving for 30 <laughs> minutes. I was just watching like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And that's when I knew the talent level. That's what the moment I was like, oh, this is something completely different. Yeah. Of all the players that went with us, to answer your question, of all the players that ended up going to Belgium, zero of them, I think, ended up playing soccer in college. Some of them ended up running track, and so which goes to the American game, right? The American game is very fast, yeah, yeah. wings. And so we had some elite athletes on the wings. We would win games because we just had players that were just faster and knew how to shoot. So we had great wingers, very much the American game. And so I think four of the guys ended up playing or running D1 track. Yeah, I don't think anybody else played like soccer. I think, I think they got recruited to play in college, but not from what I understand, no one really wanted to do it. I've heard versions of that story, obviously from Americans going over, but also frankly, the other way. Like I had friends who played basketball at a good level and they were like in the Scottish national team and then came over here and they're like, you know, we, they couldn't get in a high school team over here. So, you know, it's, it's what people grow up with. And I think that's why Europe is, is where it is in terms of the quality of players, but even just the way the fans are. We sometimes have this ridiculous discussion in Orange County. You know, we've got a five and a half thousand seat stadium. Last year we sold out, I think it was eight games, but in the previous 10 years of the club's existence, we'd never sold out more than two games. We're like, yeah, I wonder if there's just enough soft, sort of soccer fans around because, you know, LA Galaxy's just up the road and now there's LAFC and there's sort of San Diego, you know. 
in this population of millions, you know, are there enough? And then there's this wonderful map that I like to show of London where they're 12 professional teams yeah. all in an area that's probably not much bigger than sort of Irvine plus Costa Mesa. And they all sell out. There's games that, you know, you can get the bus three stops and there's 20,000 people in that stadium and 12,000 there. Like there's plenty of yeah. football fans to go right in that country because yeah. just the way they've grown up with the game. And I think in America, we're nowhere near there yet. Sure. But it's definitely beginning to grow. It's funny, yeah. from a real estate perspective, that's the one thing I always look at is density. And so I always think if we can create a product that's a little bit better, than what's already on the market, then LA in general has the density. 100%. And so we're blessed in that way where you could build something that doesn't isn't great, but as long as it's better than what's on the market. Yeah, no, indeed. And I think teams in the USL play against teams in the MLS every year. There's something called the Open Cup, which is a, yeah. every team can an enter it. And I almost wish they had it in other sports. I'd love to see the Rocket City Trash Pandas play the New York Yankees in the first round of the yeah. National Baseball Cup. But yeah. that's obviously not how, how yeah, it works. Instead, they do the celebrity games instead. But yeah. yeah. But in soccer, you have this. So we play against teams from the third and fourth division who are used to playing in front of 20 people. And once we lost one of those games a few years back and vowed never to let it happen again. But teams in the USL beat teams in the MLS every year. Uh, so we we lost, unfortunately, to LAFC a couple of years ago and to, to Portland last year. But there are teams in our league who have beaten MLS teams. There's normally half a dozen of these sort of victories every time, yeah. which shows that if it was a league and there was actual promotion relegation, the best USL teams could definitely compete with the, with the weaker MLS teams. But yeah. there's no promotion relegation for very obvious financial reasons. But if you were to go to our game and... Forget about the size of the stand compared to a bigger stadium. Just watch the the product on the field. You might not be able to tell the difference between USL and MLS. So it's you know it's really good soccer, yeah. but we pride ourselves on being a sort of community club. So at the end of the season, the players all sign the fans' jerseys and they sit on the field for an hour on tables, and the fans just walk past and get things signed. There's a real connection there. Our players know the names of some of the fans' kids who sit in the sections near the tunnel. Like it's it's a real close connection, but it's a great product, and I think we're getting better at telling our story. But you can bring your entire family to a game at Orange County Soccer Club for less than the cost of the parking. LA Galaxy and I think that's where you know there's a real accessibility so there's a sort of we don't see ourselves as a minor league sport but it's the equivalent of you know how easy it is to get Dodgers tickets and the experience you have there to what you get if you go and watch the you know the Cucamonga Dragons Uh, you know it's you're closer to the field, you've got action, but you get to see really good players. It reminds me of like the Cape Cod League in, in terms of baseball. And so yeah. in baseball, there's this place in Cape Cod. And so a lot of like the, the greats will go up, will go there. They'll play there for a little while yeah. before they make it. And so it sounds like you're building that where it's like you're giving these kids, these ambitious soccer players who are growing up and their families are, their whole life is soccer. In some way, you're giving them a window yeah. into a future. That's a big part of it. We... There's a slogan that we, we have, which is community heart, global vision. And I think we, we want to be that club that families come and watch. And we've got families who the parents will sit and watch the game and have a beer. Yeah. And the kids will be running around going on the inflatables that we have in the fan zone. And it's just a, it's a, it's an entertainment company, not just a, a football team. And I think that's a big, big part of it for us. And we tried an experiment the other day, which I've been wanting to do for years. So... The team I support in England, they're called AFC Wimbledon, and we, we're actually in Wrexham's league. So we're in the fourth division. We, we played Wrexham the other day and didn't lose, which is, which is good. So I don't know if we make it into the documentary or not, but it was nice to play them. I'm a fan of that club, and I have been for my whole life, but I'm also an owner of that club. So they did a fundraise to, to raise money to build their stadium, and I, I bought some shares. So if you go to the stadium, there's, there's bricks with my name and my kid's name on at the, at the stadium. But... Anyone who knows me knows that I'm not just a fan of this club and owner, because like with vegans, you, you tell them straight away. <laughs> so I talk about the club differently. Cause I'm not just a fan, I'm an owner. And I've always wanted to do that with Orange County. And last year, sorry, last season, which is just finished, but a few weeks ago, we signed a new 10-year stadium deal, which effectively secured the future of the club. So it felt that the time was right. So we've put a percentage of the club up for sale for, for fans to buy in. And it's one part to raise capital, but it, for me, it's about 
fan engagement and integration and giving people a chance to yeah. be sort of part of our journey. Yeah. And so far, we've raised a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but the bit that interests me the most is the number of fans. So we've got nearly 900 new owners. And the minimum investment is $100. And a lot of people have come in at $100 which is not, as you'll know, not a huge financial investment. And no one's sitting there thinking, I hope this $100 turns into $300 in eight years' time. They're doing it because they want to tell their friends down the pub that they own a piece of a, a soccer team. And, you know, it's like the Green Bay Packers model, except there is actually a return potential here. So we've also got people who've come in at five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 who also want to be part of something, but also are looking for a, a real return because they see that there's an asset that's only going to appreciate because the way soccer's growing. And so, you know, the owner of the club is very happy because there's capital coming in. But I'm very happy because it allows us to build that community more, more strongly mm -hmm. because if you can own something, you just have that different relationship. And I think it's been, it's a really fun endeavour and we've been really pleased at the way people have, have received it because it is, it's, everyone wants to own things now or yeah. join clubs and... I think the pandemic inspired that. Whether it was, you know, Peloton was one part fitness and one part finding a community when you were stuck in your garage. Yeah. And obviously now life is back to normal and Peloton's not doing so well. But people want real life experiences. Yeah. And they get that, but they also get to be part of a, of a community. And that's a, it's a fun thing to see how excited people are to, to awesome. tell their friends that they own things. Let's go to the fun stuff. What's the mascot? So his name is, sorry, its name we we're very specific around this uh, in today's modern world. Um, it is called gnarly. Gnarly. Yeah. So it is a creature, I think is the best way of describing it, <laughs> okay. from, the, from the beaches of Orange County, who, as you can see from its from boots. The shirt. It's got like a Hawaiian yeah, shirt. Yeah, it's a Hawaiian shirt. Teeth. It's got boots where its fur is. The actual mascot has furry feet. And the poke through his, its, <laughs> get this right, its worn out soccer boots from all the, all the playing it does. And it was very odd for me as, as an English person when, when I joined the team three years ago. We didn't have a mascot. So every American sports team seems to have a mascot. Yeah. And as an Englishman, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm natively at home and comfortable with the principle of mascots. You don't need a, you don't need a mascot to inspire people to come and watch soccer. But obviously in America you do. So anyway, we, <laughs> we, found, we found Gnarly and he's become... It's become a, a How many fan different favorite. choices did you go through before you landed on that? That's a great question. Like, what were the other considerations? The world of mascots is unbelievable. You, you need to have a mascot creator come on here because A, it's growing business because every sports team has one or more. But, the, you know, the, the process of ideation and then the design, how flexible do you want it to be? Do you want it to be the one that can do, you know, backflips and, and dunks off trampolines or do you want it to be the ones that kids can cuddle yeah. you know there's a whole there's a whole world around it but we uh, you know we didn't design a mascot we we found him it on the beaches of orange county but uh, it's resonated some kids crying are scared of him which <laughs> okay. is an unfortunate downside to mascots but he's also it's also very friendly and you know people love the merch and love there's so many wonderful pictures of kids little kids at the stadium just running up and, and hugging the mascot and he, he's a sort of orange gritty he, it's it's been great for us and then the, the gnome fun. yeah let's go with the yeah. gnome i mean so look well first obvious question how many gnomes do you have in your garden at uh, this time zero that will obviously change you know, within you. an hour of the podcast <laughs> ending so i'm not sure americans are necessarily gnome people but in England, I think less so now, but when I was growing up, that you go past a house in the countryside. Garden and gnomes Garden everywhere. gnomes. They're yeah. fishing, you know, they're, you've got ones that are lying down with their lunch on their, on their big bellies. You know, gnomes are whole thing. There was four different TV, you know, movies about the gnomes that they made. It's a, it's a real thing. And I've, I joined the club and I sat down with our, our head of merchandise and said, we've got to have a gnome. And they all said, don't be ridiculous. Which is fair enough. So we, we worked on it and it took me, I think, two and a half years and we finally... So he's got the same shirt as, as Gnarly. Yeah. But he's just our little gnome and it has been the, the fastest selling non-apparel really? item we've ever had. And people all over the world have been buying them and have now got them in their, in their gardens. And it, it is a fun California it, gnome in yeah, some way, right? It is. And yeah. it, it, it's one of these odd things. It seems... It's not a big deal. It's just a gnome. And, you know, in terms of... Again, going back to business, in terms of revenue, it's you know 
Right. It's not a lot. Right. But stickiness. It's the principle. We are enough of a global soccer team that we we earn the right to have a gnome that lots of people around the world want in their gardens. I've got a friend of mine who has three houses in three different countries, and they all have a gnome proudly in front of them. One in England, one here in the Hollywood Hills, and one in France. That's awesome. And it's important. What well, can you tell us? When's the season start? Well, when people listening, how can they support? Obviously, yeah. the investing stuff is pretty interesting on the ownership side. That's good. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we're, we're, we're raising with a company called Republic, who've done a lot of these sort of crowd-based raises. And the reason we chose them is because they are the parent company of a company called Cedars, through whom, in England, I bought into AFC Wimbledon. So when we were looking to do it here, I found that whole Yep. process very seamless I'm like, i want to use the people replicate it, sure. that they used here and we're actually going to launch in the uk as well through cedars so we're going to do a transatlantic raise because the people who have become fans of our club because they've bought our players or they've heard of us because of what we're doing we want to give them a chance to to become owners as well so i think we're the first plenty of soccer teams have done the whole our club's about to go out of existence please buy into us to save us. Detroit did it. Chattanooga did it. Oakland have, have just done that. Ours is not, you know, we're desperate. We're going to go out of business. Ours is, do you want to invest in the future of American soccer? You know, do you want to be the place that hones these young players who then go off and ply their talents around the world? And so it's a, it's a different sort of investment. So there's obviously, you know, we're raising the money through Republic and that's been really interesting about who's come into our community and started by merchandise and all that sort of thing f- as a result of that the season starts in march uh, so pre-season starts in in early january so where are you you know early january the players come back we get ready we're playing a couple of mls teams in the in the pre-season yeah. and then we kick off in march and we play broadly every other saturday through until october yeah. and you know if you're in la it's not a wonderful drive to Orange County, I'm not going to pretend. Although I think I can get to Irvine quicker. I can get to Irvine quicker than I can get to the, the Crypto.com arena from, from my house in the valley. So it's fun, it's friendly, it's very accessible, and it's real value. And if you're there because you love watching soccer, it's a great standard of play, and you can sit very close to the field. If you're there because you want to ditch your kids and let them run around with inflatables so you can have a beer at the other end of the stadium, that, that works as well. Five of our home games, we do beer fests, which are these amazing, good old-fashioned, all-you-can-drink beer fests. And when we started them, it was a really interesting concept. So, so we like buy in our a bracelet zone. or something? How does yeah, that, so yeah. You, you get a wristband, you go in, you get a little tasting cup, and you go around this 50 different breweries, and you have your little drinks. And when we started doing it, there were some people who turned up who didn't even know there was a soccer game going on, sort of 25 feet away. They were just there because it's set up like any other, any other beer fest. And we've been obviously tracking the numbers. So many of them have now become season ticket holders. So there are people who come for the beer and stay for the soccer. There's people who come for the soccer and stay for the beer. We've tried to get sort of, you know, we are about entertaining people. And and beer and sport works incredibly well Programming matters. How do you think about the marketing side of it? And so do you guys do a lot on socials? Is there a bang for buck there? Or is it more community-driven things work better? Yeah, I mean, we, every sports team, you know, does their socials. And I think we've struggled a little bit with the concept around it. So if you're a major league sports team, whether it's baseball or basketball, your your players, you know, if a player appears on a video, everyone's watching it for that player. Now, people don't know who our players are yet. So some of it's been sort of team-led, but we're trying to let people see these players. So we've got a wonderful young man called Bryce Jameson who's just come back from the under-17 World Cup where he's representing the U.S., and he's got such great personality and he's he is going to he's the sort of player who you can expect to see in the national team at, at some stage and we expect him to go to Europe within a year but he's got a great personality and he's not a household name obviously but we're trying to give him a profile so a bit of it's been team led but we're getting better now at trying to tell the stories of the players because we've got we've got fascinating players who've come we recruit from all over the world so we've got really interesting players who've played at World Cups. We've had players who played in the Premier League and then, you know, now with us. And we, we you know, we like to, to tell their stories. But we do a lot of digital marketing. I mean, we probably don't do TikTok enough of, in a way that every brand is now. And I think we need to be better because we probably need to lower the, the average age a little bit uh, at the stadium because I think soccer's growing. And the sad part is there, there are probably people who live in the Great Park in Irvine who don't know that there's a soccer team playing in that stadium and I think 
we need to be better at telling the, the story of that. And some of we're doing through building the community. So there's a lot of word of mouth. There's a lot of, we do this bring a buddy scheme where season tickets can bring a friend to certain games for free. And we've done that because there's no better way to build your base of season ticket holders. Yeah. We've rarely met someone who hasn't come to a game and, and enjoyed the experience, yeah. but not enough people are coming to the game for the first time. And even though you're a, you were a soccer player, you're a soccer fan, I don't think you'd heard of Orange County Soccer Club. After the Belgium experience, I, I, I didn't watch soccer until the last World Cup. I couldn't watch it until not, not, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> not that long ago. Just all. because you, you realized that you just... It wasn't there was just something sport. about it where I was like, I loved it. You know, yeah. I just loved it. And I thought like I had a feel for the game. Like I thought if I had any strength, I could just see things before they happen, you yeah. know? And, and, and so when I watch it, it's like I'm tapping into the thing I was actually really good at, yeah. which is just seeing the play before it happens. And now I can't, I can't even do that. <laughs> and I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I started playing tennis. Interesting. So, so tennis has become my new obsession, but you know, obviously I did watch the last world cup almost religiously a yeah. single game basically so our head coach so was, was there with the danish national team as a as a coach as part of the denmark setup and he's now our head coach and i love talking to him about his stories about what he saw at the world cup in terms of just the craziness of the place they were in but also just right. the way teams prepare now it's, it's it's extraordinary but look you know you've got a scarf you've got a gnome you've even got a, you know the plush of the mascot so i'll tell you i'm, I I'm feel excited like you should come to a game i'm gonna come to a game whether there's beer or not doesn't matter i'm gonna come <laughs> Because I like it. I like the story. I want to support. But where can people find you? Tell them where they can find you. So Website, all that. We're orangecountysoccer.com. And we're on the, all the social channels as Orange County SC. Okay. Um, and, you know, if people are interested in this whole ownership thing, if they go on to Republic yeah, we'll and search a, Orange we'll add a link County, to yeah, the, yeah. I think that's great. And I want the club to do well because it's my job. But it's become, I've always loved the sport. And I've grown up probably outside the Premier League ground. So a lot of people, the casual football fan, you know, who do you support? You know, you support a Liverpool or a less so Man United at the moment, but a Manchester City. And I think when I was a kid, my team was was Wimbledon, who were in the Premier League. Well, it was actually, the, it wasn't even called the Premier League. That's how old I am. But the, the league that was the top league before the Premier League, I was a Wimbledon fan. But even when we're in the top league, they were the least popular team. So the four lowest Premier League crowds... Uh, are all Wimbledon games. Uh, we've had more people at Orange County than watched four Wimbledon games in the Premier League. That's how bad their crowds were in the Premier League. So I'm used to smaller teams, and I used to referee at a reasonable level. I refereed semi-pro football in England. And so I was used to these sort of grounds which hold a few thousand people. And I think part of it for me, the attraction's always been the community aspect. Yeah. Like, I love seeing the fact that our players are friends with the fans in, in a completely different way to you see at that top level because there's an accessibility to to the stadium and I, I like that growth because that's not how American sport right. from the outside it's all flashy NBA NFL where you're not even sure what the, some of the players look like because they wear helmets college games with 100,000 people watching it's not that community in a way and I think yeah. we're building that in a, in a different way. And I, it's so fun to be part of a, of a growing sport in a community-based club. It's funny that when you say that there's, there's people I know that sort of grew up with these, some of these sports. And so at that one time in the NBA, as an example, you could go to a game and you could even go into the locker room. <laughs> really? Like yeah. it was just so new and people, it wasn't really working. And so your access to the players was undeniable. So they moved it from anyone had access to just the reporters all of a sudden. So that, that happened in like the 80s and 90s, which is crazy to think yeah, about. And then you think about today, and it's just like the press room. But at the time, it was like the game's over. You could go on the court if you wanted. You could go to the locker room if you could bother them. Really interesting because they weren't like famous. They weren't. Yeah. They, was, they were just guys you supported. And I've always liked that sort of sport. My wife is uh, really into track and field, and I remember... We, when we lived in Europe, we'd go around watching the, the European championships and you'd stay in a hotel and you're in the same hotel as the athletes because they're not, they're not household names and people don't bother you. are having breakfast and the person on the next table yeah. is maybe not the morning of the race, but you know, they could be having breakfast the day after they've won a gold medal and they're just, they're just there. Yeah. And I've always liked that, that access. And I used to be a sports journalist, so 
in a in a first life and i I like the fact I knew players, and that was some of that was very high level. You know, I interviewed David Beckham and Usain Bolt, but what I like is just getting to understand people. Now, social media has changed a lot of how you feel like you know people because you're reading their comments, not filtered through a journalist. But at our level, people actually know them. You see, you know, our players will come off the field and high five a, a ten year old kid and say. You know, I saw that video you made the other day. So one of there's one young guy, he's a season ticket holder's kid, who's who's a really good young player, and he's followed by half of the players and the team on Instagram. So he'll post a video of some skill that he's learned, and the players are, are congratulating him in real life. And I just I can't imagine seeing that somewhere else. Yeah. If you've been a soccer fan for years here, you won't say the sport's new, but it it feels like it's young You're very in much this so. country. And there's a chance to sort of get in at the bottom level as a as a fan and get in before it becomes ridiculous yeah. and maybe MLS is already ridiculous with billion dollar valuations and Lionel Messi running around playing and ticket prices going through the roof but I think our level just feels like a really interesting time to get involved in the sport and we're we're excited to tell the story and see new faces in the stadium thanks for coming yeah. I appreciate it well thank you very much this has been it's great it's great yeah. to talk to someone who unfortunately probably is better <laughs> at soccer than I, I was when that. I was 12 I don't know about that Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Diego. Cheers. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.